Okay. Welcome, everyone, to uh, this Warringah Tri Club uh, Q&A, which it's, it's funny because, you know, we're talking to a triathlete group, but we're talking about protein. And I think it's always funny because protein's become that macronutrient that now endurance athletes are starting to pay attention to, and rightly so. So, look, what we'll do is uh, get through the information and if at any time you want to ask some questions on any of the slides, please feel free. It's a very relaxed session and uh, just ask questions. If you don't want to ask a question or interrupt, just pop it in the chat and then we'll go through it at the end. Okay. So this is the agenda. We'll give an overview on protein. Um, we'll talk about some concepts to consider and then we'll have time for Q&A. Okay. Okay. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, okay? Protein, protein, protein intake for all athletes should fall in a similar range, regardless if you are male, female, young, or old. And I know that might catch some of you by surprise because of recent sort of information on social media and whatnot. But when you actually look at the research for an endurance athlete, when we're talking about muscle protein synthesis, uh, recovery, bone health, and everything else that protein acts on within the human body, then we believe, and based on the research, that that range, regardless if you're male, female, young or old, should be fairly similar. And that makes it nice because then it's a lot easier to think about. So we'll talk about protein history. So I break this into three categories. I guess the first category is what we call sustenance. So if you know anything about the World Health Organization, they give a recommendation which is an RDI, the recommended daily intake of 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. Now, this is to sustain life. It is not the amount of protein that an athlete requires, or certainly anyone who's looking to optimize either lean, lean muscle mass recovery or athletic uh, ability. And that, you know, they look at that from a sustenance perspective. And then if you look at the research around athlete, athletes and athletic performance, there was a notion at one point based on the studies that around 20 grams of protein was what was required to maximize muscle protein synthesis or the ability to stimulate muscle growth. And that was like sort of all the hype. That's where a lot of the research and a lot of the information that was provided to athletes. And I can think even when I was playing rugby that we were told, you know, around 20 grams of protein was all you required for per feed um, across the day to get your maximal protein synthesis. Now, what this doesn't consider is age-related changes. It obviously doesn't consider things like hormones. It doesn't take into consideration activity and optimization, but what it also didn't take into consideration was the length of time that these studies went for. So it didn't actually investigate how long that muscle protein synthesis or that threshold for muscle protein building actually occurred for. It was tending to be for a very short period of time investigation, i.e. four to six hours. So we fast forward and then we go to maybe what we call maintenance. And this is where some of the information started to come forward where now they were looking at, you know, levels of at least even double what the World Health Organization was re um, recommending. So up to 1.6 grams per kilo body weight. When you start to look at new studies, they started saying, hey, what if we went above 20 grams per feed and what happens to muscle protein synthesis based on the body weight of the athlete? Because I guess when you, you think of Arnold Schwarzenegger or any of the famous bodybuilders, they certainly weren't having 20 grams of protein per feed because it's relative to body mass as well. So now they started looking at 20, 30, 40 grams of protein and the recommendations started going up and that's per feed or per meal, Okay. What this looked at was obviously, and I say myopic, but muscle outcomes. So it started looking at creation of lean mass and retention of lean mass and what happens to net protein balance in the body. Obviously, if you're in a positive net protein balance, then you're not going to be breaking down or what we call a catabolic state, which is bad over the course of days and weeks. You want to be at least in balance or try and be in a net protein balance if possible, if you're trying to put on muscle and recover faster. So these, these studies started looking at, you know, higher amounts of protein, but still probably didn't study the duration um, of what the effect of these higher protein feeds were 
in the body. So they were still looking at fairly short periods, four to six hours, certainly not 12 or 24 hours. But it started to account for age. So they started saying, hey, maybe if you're older, you actually need more, pro well, you need high levels of protein that are similar to what a younger person needs because what was always the narrative was, oh, you're getting older, you're doing less exercise, you're doing less activity, therefore you don't need as much protein. No, what they started to say was actually, you're old, you need just as much as a young person. So that's sort of where the narrative changed. Started to account for activity, started to account for outcomes. Again, improvements in lean mass, improvements in body composition. Again, the limitations, as I described before, was potentially the design of these studies. So were they true crossover type studies? Were they randomized controlled? What were the subjects? The subjects typically are younger males. There weren't a lot of older males studied. There certainly weren't a lot of women studied, young or old. The duration of the studies were often very short as well. So it was looking at the short-term impact of protein feeding. And that's, that's fine. That's the study limitations. But it obviously created some awareness of just how important protein was. So then we come into the third stage, maybe where we're at now in the state of sort of protein research, which I probably would call the optimized stage. And maybe it's not as optimized as it will be, but certainly at this point in time, it's better than sustenance and certainly better than maintenance. So now we start to look at numbers upwards of two grams per kilo of body weight, anywhere up to three. And there are studies well above three grams per kilo of body weight, which is still safe. And then what we're looking at is feeds or uh, feeds, when I say feeds, per meal feeds of 30, anywhere up to 100 grams of protein. And there was a very recent study, which has been all over social media, talking about 100 grams of protein in the form of a milk concentrate, so a slower digesting milk protein um, or milk concentrate, and comparing 25 grams to 100 grams. And what they did was study it over a very long period of time. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But what it showed is that that muscle protein synthesis can continue to go up and at least stay very positive with larger amounts of protein ingested in a single meal, which then starts to make you think, okay, well, do I just, can I possibly just eat all my protein in one meal? Yes, you potentially could, but there are some downsides to that, which I will cover. So then you're starting to think, okay, as well, it's not just about muscle protein synthesis. There's a whole lot of other factors in the human body which protein works with. So every cell in the human body is made from amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. So now you're starting to think, okay, well, muscle protein synthesis might be maxed out, but what about my bones? What about my heart? What about immunity? All those other systems rely on protein as well. So potentially the more protein you have in your system, the better you could be. So now, again, it is accounting for age, sex, activity, and like most science, more research required. But that's where we're at at this current state. So I, I mentioned this study. So this is the protein threshold study. Um, and this was uh, a group in, in Holland, uh, Van Loon's group, 36 healthy male subjects. Now, remember, it is males. It's not females. So we've got to think of that when we're talking about the population and the the applicability of this study to potentially you. Age, 18 to 40, great. Typical age for a lot of triathletes. They were recreationally trained in lifting weights. So this was focused on resistance trained athletes. Again, not triathletes. But we hope that most athletes now are lifting weights in some form and are what we would consider recreationally trained. So what they did was they drank um, either a placebo, 25 grams or 100 grams of protein milk drink after weights training. And what it looked at was the endogenous and the exogenous amino acids over 12 hours. So they infused, they did this stable isotope into the person to look at the endogenous or the stores um, of muscle already within the body and amino acids. And then the actual milk drink was labeled as well. So they could look at what happened to those amino acids over the course of 12 hours. And I've put the reference there as well. So what it looked at here was that things to ponder about is that protein oxidation, okay, the way in which protein is utilized, the amount of protein being broken down, both on a whole body and also from a muscle protein synthesis threshold, based on a single feed has sort of been 
turned on its head as a result of this. Now, there are there is some criticism saying that it's a slow acting protein and therefore it's not the same as, say, a whey protein, which could put your muscle protein synthesis up very quickly. And do we know that? But in the scheme of real world, we eat food, we drink milk. So what this showed is that you could potentially eat a very, very large amount of protein in a single meal, doesn't necessarily have to be breakfast, but potentially after your training. And that could potentially sustain you for a large period of time, i.e. at least 12 hours. So it is possible to do it. You could eat it all at breakfast, but is it practical? I think the big practical limitations on this is that if you have more than two trainings or more than one training session in a day, do you really want to eat 100 grams of protein? Now, that's not 100 grams of meat. 100 grams of protein is like 500 grams. Okay, so half a kilo, 600 grams of chicken, steak, pork, or tofu. It's not really that practical to do. And so it could potentially have negative impact on training. You will feel very full. And also, if you're eating that amount of protein, what happens to things like extra fats that you're consuming and certainly carbohydrates? So does it come at the cost of you not consuming carbohydrates in that meal because you're so full on half a kilo of steak? Okay. The big takeaway message from this is if you have not hit your targets for protein, don't be afraid of taking in a much larger amount of protein in that feed to get you to whatever amount it is that you're being recommended now, we will go into the amounts, but what I'm showing you there is a screenshot. So this athlete here, I think it's actually my screenshot, aiming for 180 grams of protein a day, which is roughly 2.2 2 .2 grams per kilo body weight that I target. If, say, I got to dinner and I was 50 or 60 grams short on protein, I could double up my protein sources, i.e. Uh, meat sources, fish, tofu, plant-based proteins, grains, breads, pastas, and increase my total protein intake in the evening to hit that total of 60 grams and not be too concerned that it's going to be a waste of uh, money, first and foremost, and that it's going to be wasted on the body. The body will, by looking at this research paper, will actually use that um, protein, that extra protein to assist your body in a lot of different ways. So then we come into animal versus plant protein. Does anyone have any questions on that before I go on? Or we can talk about it at the end. Okay, okay, go. So animal versus protein, uh, animal versus plant protein. I guess this is a question we get a lot. Is animal protein better than plant protein? So plant protein does have a what we call a lower postprandial or after eating uh, it does tend to have a lower muscle protein synthesis level. So what we were talking about there is how quickly it comes up to peak levels of muscle protein synthesis. Plant compared to animal is a little bit lower. Plant, it does have a different amino acid composition to animal protein. You've probably heard about an essential amino acid called leucine. Leucine is one of the key amino acids to trigger muscle protein synthesis. Plant proteins will typically have lower amounts of that amino acid. Plant protein also has a different amino acid absorption rate. So the way it has a slower rate of absorption within the gut, from the gut or the stomach into the small intestine and from the small intestine. So that also is something to consider that you won't get those peak levels as high as animal protein, but as demonstrated in the other study, maybe that's not that important because it maybe is the length of time that it's doing the work that may be just as important. So the other consideration is, is that in order to get uh, higher amounts of vegetable proteins, you obviously need to eat more food. As a result of eating more food, you're obviously taking in more calories. So if you are an athlete who's struggling with weight or looking to drop weight, then that could be a consideration why you may want to use animal protein over vegetarian protein. Okay, if you think about plant protein though, you can get the equivalent amounts of amino acids that are similar to plant proteins just by mixing the sources of it. So mixing, so not just eating a single source of plant protein, and we'll cover some of those proteins, um, and certainly eating more of it is a way to get around those limitations. 
So when we look at the studies then, the more recent studies that have compared plant protein, and that is mixed source plant proteins to animal proteins, we see actually very little differences, despite those differences I mentioned in muscle protein, total muscle protein synthesis, strength, force production, and body composition. So that is in particular when they're looking at studies that have things like pea protein, soy protein, and fava bean, uh, corn, potato, brown rice. When you have a mix of pro plant proteins together, when they are compared to say a whey protein concentrate or whey protein isolate, the differences in the study are not uh, they're not significant and therefore not practical. And so an athlete could potentially consider taking in mixed plant protein, so multiple sources of plant protein in the form of a supplement in order to maximize those sort of components. The majority of studies to, that have been done, however, are on younger males and most of them are to do with strength training. So we can't necessarily say with definitive sort of knowledge that this is applicable to older men and we can't say for certain that it is applicable to women um, however some of the studies have involved women and those studies have also been very similar in terms of the outcomes the duration of the studies is often limited so similar to the very first study i talked about um, the duration at which they've measured muscle protein synthesis has tended to be four to six hours so we don't know for certain whether taking in animal protein versus plant protein over a longer duration, if it was studied, does that have a better um, impact on say net protein balance in the body and how your body responds to that? What we do know though, and the key takeaway from animal versus plant protein is that if you are going to eat plant proteins and a, or plant derived proteins, so that would be things like your legumes, your pulses, um, even wheat, uh, pastas, things like that, or a plant-based protein. So i.e. Um, something like the true protein plant protein, which has fava bean, I think it's fava, soy, and I think brown rice protein, something like that as an actual protein supplement. You just want to make sure that you're eating more of it. So if you were using a plant-based protein supplement, you will often see per 30 grams of it per scoop, it will probably give you 20 grams of protein. For a whey-based good quality protein isolate per scoop will probably give you 25 to 28 grams of protein. So the simple answer to get your net or your total amount of protein from plant supplements is just you need to probably take twice as much. So in order to get 40 grams, protein you would need two scoops versus an animal protein where you may only need one to one and a half scoops so just keep that in mind using specific blends so i mentioned some of the leucine in particular is one of those amino acids which is slightly lower so you'd need to use again if you had two scoops of a plant protein that will often put you over sort of the threshold for the amount of leucine you need um, but also other things like methionine and uh, lysine will be uh, tend to be higher in uh, animal-based proteins. And so if you then mix, again, you don't need to think about it, but if you're picking a plant protein that has mixed sources, then it will tend to have more of those specific, specific amino acids and be very similar to an animal sourced one. The other option you could do is fortifying foods with specific free amino acids. So you can buy things like leucine, you can buy branch chain amino acids, and you can buy essential amino acids. Honestly, it's not something that I would tend to recommend. I think it's a little bit passe, probably very expensive and tastes like absolute crap and doesn't mix very well. So of those, I'd probably say number three, I wouldn't do as a first line recommendation unless in some specific cases. I would just say you, if you're if you are a vegan or a vegetarian athlete, you just need to eat more of your plant-derived proteins or plant-based protein sources, and you need to use specific blends or um, make sure that you're eating multiple sources of those plants in order to get the total amount of protein and the correct amount of amino acids. Okay, premenopausal women. So. At this point in time, 
There are no studies that address the protein requirements of female athletes across the menstrual cycle or with use of hormonal contraceptives. And I just want to re-emphasize that. There are no studies that address the specific protein requirements of female athletes across a menstrual cycle or use of hormonal contraceptives. We do know, however, that protein catabolism or the breakdown of protein is higher at rest and following exercise during the second half of your menstrual cycle. Okay, so this is where that notion of maybe you should take higher amounts of protein in your luteal phase, but maybe lower amounts in your follicular phase. What I would argue with that is that is an absolute pain in the ass. You've got enough stuff going on and there are no studies to support that claim. There is, what we do know is that there's no difference in what we call muscle protein synthesis and collagen protein synthesis between the two phases, 24 hours later, again, short period of time, after 60 minutes of resistance exercise. Now, can we say that applies to endurance exercise? Maybe, maybe not, but we know that there is no difference. So what we do know is that women physiologically are different from men. There is no doubt about that. And that is very interesting in science. What is very unclear is whether these physiological responses to exercise across a menstrual cycle actually influence protein requirements of female athletes. And when we have looked at studies, when we look at carbohydrates, for instance, there is this notion of cycling your carbohydrates based on your menstrual cycle. If you look at the research on that, there is no practical benefit in doing that. It is just a headache and you are better off manipulating your carbohydrates based on the training that is being given to you by your coach. If your coach wants to manipulate your training so you have lower intensity training in your second half of your phase, luteal phase, then great. The nutrition should be manipulated to follow that. I.e., you could probably have lower amounts of carbs, higher amounts of fat. But if you, if you are doing high intensity exercise in the luteal phase, then carbohydrates still need to be very present. And I would argue, and based on the current research, that protein requirements should not differ between the luteal phase and the follicular phase. There is certainly more research required in this area, but at this point in time, there does not need to be, or there does not appear to be any benefit in you cycling your protein. So things that we do know is that the estimated average requirement for a female premenopausal, somewhere between one point, let's say 1.3 to 1.65. What we know is that when someone is given that amount, so you know, 1.6, double the World Health Organization's recommendation, that that actually results in what we call a nitrogen balance, okay? And that's not a good thing, of being around 50%. So in other words, you're in a net negative balance of nitrogen related to net protein balance. So then if we go to above what is the estimated average requirement and go to potentially what is a recommended daily intake, we see that it gets better. Now they're talking maybe 1.6 up to 2 grams per kilo of body weight. What you do need to know is that if your protein intake is low, then carbohydrates and energy availability, okay, can certainly impact that. If they're low, then you're going to need more protein. So again, think about that. If you're trying to do a low carbohydrate diet and you're trying to go into a negative balance because you're trying to lose weight, you certainly don't want to be reducing protein because actually your requirement becomes even more higher. So we're just looking at that number and we say, okay, let's look at the up end of that. It's at least two grams per kilo of body weight. We know that there's limited research, okay, on women. So we can't say definitively where it is, but when we look at the research and we look at these equations and we look at the upper ends, we say, okay, you're up at at least two grams per kilo body weight a day. And that's where you should be starting to think about being as a minimum. That's pre-menopause women. Okay, so now we come into menopause women. Obviously, hot topic. Um, certainly higher protein intake is required than previously thought. Now, I just want to emphasize that previously thought. It's not that suddenly menopausal women are needing more protein than younger athletes, although there could be a, maybe an argument for that as they are very old, but it's just that you require the same amount of protein as a younger counterpart. 
It's your muscles need it just as much. There is anabolic resistance going on for men and women. And so you certainly don't want to be reducing your protein intake. Yes, the Mediterranean plant-based diet is proposed as the best form of diet, but the really important thing, if you are going to adhere to, say, very much a predominant plant-based diet, and I'm all for that, uh, for men and women, um, we don't get enough veggies and fruit, um, you need to make sure that your total protein intake within that Mediterranean-based diet is certainly on the higher end, and I will touch on what that looks like. When we look at uh, a study, and it is... Uh, this study here I mentioned, uh, the Greendale study, 2019. So it's, you know, it's a few years old now. They followed, I think, 1,600 women, and they looked at them across menopause. Lean body mass only dropped around 0.2, gram, 0.2 kilograms per year, and fat mass only gained around half a kilo. Okay, And that was with two years going from uh, the transition from um, menopause transition to full menopause. So those numbers don't have to be huge either. Okay, and I know a lot of women who go through menopause do struggle with body composition, fat mass gains and lean body mass drops. But potentially, if you get your nutrition right, that a lot of that can be offset. There's certainly a lack of research for menopausal athletes. Okay, and that's very important as well. There's more research coming out on menopausal women, but menopausal athletes, there is a dearth of research at this point in time. Really cool study that came out of Australia, actually. Um, so what they showed was that menopausal women have an increased protein breakdown. So you will tend to break down protein at a higher rate than, say, your younger um, compatriot. And what we know is that menopausal, oh, menopause drives an increase um, in what they call a protein-specific appetite. So it's effectively saying that as you go into menopause, you may actually crave more protein-specific uh, foods. And they call this the protein leverage effect. So when you eat more protein as a menopausal female, you tend to reduce your intake of these non-protein energy sources, i.e. carbohydrates and fat. However, if you don't eat higher amounts of protein, that then leads you to consume higher amounts of fat and carbohydrates. And in doing that, when you start to consume higher amounts, so volumes of fat and carbohydrates, what happens with that is you tend to take in more calories. So it's not that you're taking in carbohydrates and they're making you fat, or you're taking in fat and they're making you fat. It's that you're consuming more calories as a result. So one of the things that you can do in menopause and it is recommended is keep your protein level or your protein intake high bumps in protein can reduce as it says reduce weight gain and improve losses in lean body mass and that's a really simple concept to get through if you eat more protein you potentially will eat less fat less carbohydrates certainly you need carbs if they're required and you're training hard i'm not saying that but over consumption of fat and carbs if you get your protein intake right. So things to ponder for menopausal women. What we know is that a level of 1.6 grams per kilo body weight in a few studies, we don't have heaps, does not necessarily maintain lean body mass or lean, lean body mass in menopausal women. So we need a number higher than at least 1.6 grams. We know that menopause increases muscle breakdown we also know that hormone replacement therapy can actually reverse this. Menopause also induces impaired protein synthesis, what we call anabolic resistance. Anabolic resistance is also prevalent in men. So this is why older men also should be eating similar amounts of protein to their younger counterparts. We need to be thinking beyond muscle. When we're talking about protein intakes, we know 1.6 grams doesn't necessarily help with lean body mass. It levels up to 1.8 grams, potentially don't even have a positive impact. When we see levels going up over two grams per kilo of body weight, we start to see some positive impact. So now when you're thinking about being, a you think about premenopausal, we said that upper limit when we're looking at it or the lower limit you should be looking at is around two grams per kilo of body weight. 
for menopausal women, that lower number again coming up, two grams per kilo of body weight, two to three grams per kilo of body weight of protein. That's where we're starting to think. So if we look at all that research, what do we know? Okay, and I put in the right-hand corner, you know, I can see it coming as a result of this 100-gram intake. There'll be the big hit protein diet and, um, you know, people will be pushing you and they need to eat one meal a day and it only needs to have 100 grams of protein or something like that. Please don't do that. It's not required. The reason why you probably want to spread out, and we can talk about protein time in a minute, is more from a practical standpoint. So if we start at the bottom of your protein pyramid, what every athlete needs to be thinking about if you're an athlete and you want to improve lean body mass, you want to maintain lean body mass, you want to improve immunity or have good immunity, you want to think about your bone health, you're thinking about cellular health, then a protein intake of at least two to three grams per kilo body weight would be recommended. And that is what we recommend at Fuel Lean. Protein quality is probably the next thing to think about. We don't know for sure, but it looks like plant and animal proteins come out roughly on top. Maybe a little bit faster if we're talking about a whey protein isolate in terms of the rates at which we can max out muscle building. But over the course of duration, probably pretty similar. Protein timing, maybe it's less important. Less important in terms of the notion of you need to pulse your feeds of protein to maximize the ability to build muscle. No, what you need to do is pulse out your protein so that your total amount of protein across the day is feasible. As I said, eating 100 grams of protein in one sitting is possible and potentially feasible for some people. But for a lot of people, they'll feel very sick and they won't be able to work, let alone exercise. So actually spreading out your protein between at least three main meals and maybe two to three snacks throughout the day to hit your total amount of protein is going to be far more important. Total protein intake across the course of 24 hours, across the course of a week, across the course of a month is going to be the most important thing in terms of improving muscle protein synthesis, net protein balance, bone health, immunity, and everything like that. And then finally at the top, the differences between young and old, male and female, really are not that much different. And to keep things similar or simple, you don't need to be thinking, okay, okay, I'm an older female, I potentially need a lot, I need more than my younger counterpart. No, you need probably the same amount as your younger counterpart and vice versa. Same for male, say, uh, same for males versus females. It does not have to be different. And it does not have to be complicated. You certainly, if you are a premenopausal female with a menstrual cycle, I would certainly urge you not to be thinking about uh, changing your protein intake based on your menstrual cycle at this point in time, because there is no evidence for it. So as such, this is our takeaway that I, it's a summary of what I just talked about. Total protein intake is your first priority, two to three grams per kilo of body weight. Obviously, the difference between two and three grams is probably going to be based on your total caloric intake, but certainly aiming for at least two grams per kilo of body weight. Second is the quality. Third is the timing. Finally, your sex and age. If you really want to go through it, there might be an argument for Older, older people, maybe as we get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, may be having even more than 40 grams of protein in a single hit. But again, total amount of protein, I would still keep in that two to three grams per kilo body weight range. Practical application is king. Actually eating it and getting it in on a regular basis is what's going to make you a better athlete. And there's some examples of proteins. Potatoes have protein. Bread has protein. Uh, pasta bases, uh, pizza bases have protein. And a lot of people don't realize that. Yogurt has protein in it. Vegetables do have some protein. Obviously, seafood has protein. Octopus is one of my favorite sources of protein. Very lean, very good source of protein. And obviously, micronutrients such as zinc and B12. And then you've got things like chicken and steak. These are all photos from home, okay? I like to cook, but you're all... No matter what your dietary preference is, you can get the amounts of protein in. Yes, if you're a vegan athlete, you will need to be far more structured in the way in which you approach this. And you certainly will need to use uh, products like tofu, seitan, uh, temper to augment your diet and probably using something like uh, a blended plant protein supplement to hit your total amounts of protein. 
Um, for every other athlete, either a lacto ovo vegetarian or an omnivore, um, the use of a protein supplement should be there to complement your diet. So if you are going to use a whey protein isolate or a milk protein concentrate or whey protein concentrate, you should not be relying on that to hit your total protein amounts. It should be there used preferably as a snack, say 30 to 40 grams of protein in that shake, potentially after you're doing some form of resistance training or your hardest session of the day. Treat it like a treat and a snack but it's certainly just complementing your food intake to hit your protein target. Any questions? Does anyone know? Uh, yeah, I do actually. So yeah. um, in terms of say, if you are, like you said, uh, supplementing every now and again with a, a whey protein or anything, what does, actually a good quality protein, whey protein look like in terms of, you know, a combination of what, what's in it or what, to, is there anything you need to avoid in it or? Um, well, the I, I actually would say to, the short answer is just use true protein, honestly. It's on the Northern beaches and it's just such a great brand. Um, I think it's, it is a wonderful um, supplement. I had a look at Old Bull as well. Um, I think they've got a whey protein, just a singular whey protein isolate as well. Um, I know they do sponsor Ringer Tri Club. Look, the thing you're looking for is minimal ingredients. It should just say whey protein isolate in it. Uh, there might be some soy lectin in there, which they just spray lightly at the very end. It's, everyone gets a bit worried about the soy lectin, but it's actually just something that they have to spray over it at the very end. Um, should have minimal intervention in terms of flavors shouldn't have any sugar in it. Um, again, that would be done on the flavorings. Things like stevia or glycosides, they're fine. That's stevia plant. It's just the um, TGA makes them call it stevia or glycosides, which make it sound absolutely horrible. Um, the protein content of a whey protein isolate should be somewhere in that sort of, you know, per 30 grams, it should be like 26 to 28 grams of protein. So the concentration of it should be higher. A protein concentrate, will be a little bit lower. So that will probably be in the 24 to 25 grams per scoop. Um, and then a milk protein concentrate, what that will have in it is what's called um, a casein protein. So it will be a blend of say a whey protein concentrate and then a, um, a casein blend. And so that's slower digesting, um, pretty thick. So a lot of athletes, if they are going to use that, will tend to drink that at night before going to bed. And that is a strategy if you're, a, an older athlete um, and struggle with training and sort of soreness and recovery, or if you, um, you know, like to try and get your protein in overnight and recover overnight. Yeah. I think you made a really key point there as well is that buy an Australian um, protein. Don't, don't get anything from, from the US. Yeah, who's saying that? Sorry. Are, 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 are definitely are full of fillers. Yeah, who's saying that? Sorry, I can't Sorry, see. Graham. Graham, yeah, look, hundred no, percent. The Australian, uh, well, that's why all the, uh, yeah, what have we got? Like nine hundred US athletes, and they're all buying uh, True Protein now because they yeah. all think it's the bomb. Uh, because it's it's got no fillers in it. It's yeah. it tastes great. It's hundred percent natural, and I think honestly, we're so lucky to have such a great quality company on the northern beaches. Uh, you can certainly uh, use it. Um, yeah, look look for E numbers and all that crap in the ingredients list, and then you can pretty much sort it out. Um, and Scott, questions. it's David, David here. Um, yeah, Dave. What do, what do you think about protein bars? Um, so I think, look, things like protein bars, the problem is, and this is the problem with sort of people trying to hit macros. So, yes, I mean, look, at Fuel In, yeah, we, we talk about macros. I was just talking about macros in terms of – so macros are protein, fat, and carbohydrates, just for anyone listening. Um, we talk about macros a lot and people focus on hitting their macro targets. The problem when you really focus on hitting macro targets is some athletes will tend to uh, then use products like protein bars, which do give you maybe 20, 25 grams of protein, five, 10 grams of fat, and you know 20 grams of carbs. And so that looks great when you're tracking. However, they're usually like, where am I, this big? They don't, they don't create any level of satiation or fullness. 
Um, and I would usually argue like rather than eating something like that, I know they're very convenient, but if you have the option to eat whole foods Absolutely. rather than a protein bar, I would certainly recommend it. They're less processed. There's no matter how much you try and get minimal intervention in protein bars, there's always stuff in there that you probably are better off not having. Like go and buy a rotisserie chicken, strip it, eat some of it, put it in a flour tortilla, um, you know, a piece of bread, something like that, wrap it up, eat that as a snack, I'd say would be uh, such a better thing. Boiled eggs, beef jerky, or beef jerky can be hit and miss as well. Um, can of tuna, can of um, salmon, tinned salmon, all those sorts of things are just such better protein snacks than say a protein bar. However, having a protein bar at the bottom of your gym bag and having it as a like, you know, shit, I'm out of food, I don't have anything, I'm starving, probably better off having that in there as well. So that's where I sort of sit on them. Terrific. Thank you. Cool. I've uh, I've got another question if possible. Um, yeah. So if you're um, trying to get down to a specific like race weight, how would you do that without also dropping kind of muscle mass? I mean, yeah. you just keep, just eat a load of protein basically, but... <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, I, I guess the question we always, I always get, like, we get about race weight a lot. A lot of people are, you know, they may think that, okay, I've got to get down a kilo, you know. Like, what are you thinking of dropping, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, well, I'm, I'm normally about in between 78 and 80. I'm currently in between 80 and 82. So okay. I'd like to get below 80. <laughs> um, yeah. But so... I'm going to speak from personal experience and I'm also going to speak from pro athlete and elite age group experience here. So from personal experience, I was hell bent on being 79 kilos and constantly chasing it. And it just is a terrible way. I was 80, 81, whatever. Actually, when I just gave up on that and just started and put my plan on, okay, I'm happy to be 81 heap more calories because I wasn't in a caloric deficit. Suddenly energy was there, a lot more energy, a lot more sort of exuberance, willingness to train, motivation to train. You know what? Actually weight ended up coming down to about 80 odd kilos, I think, because my energy output actually went up. So, you know, that difference, like if you're at 80 kilos and you're trying to get to 79, honestly, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, same conversation. If you listen to Sky Monch talk on uh, the triathlon show, uh, the triathlon hour with Jack Kelly, uh, where she was talking about her you know, previous coach and what she endured with like getting told to lose weight. The focus with her was just, Hey, let's just, you know, we got a DEXA done. So I would also encourage you to get a DEXA scan done, uh, which looks at your body composition. So you can look at things like your fat free mass, your fat mass, your bone mineral density, um, get that done. I think you have to see a doctor GP to get that requested, but I'd certainly recommend it. And then, you know, if you're sitting as an age group athlete, if you're anywhere between 10 and 20% body fat, I would focus on training the house down, eating, eating enough, eating really well, and just really loving your training. Yeah. I think the thing we forget, like I get, you know, we're all probably competitive, but I think you got to step back at some point and go, you know, am I going to be world champion? Um, do I need to worry about this in the bigger scheme of things? Am I doing this to be healthy? And that like, if you're going to go and lose a kilo of lean mass with maybe a kilo of fat mass at the same time, I'd argue that's not a very smart move. So, and now you're a lean athlete. Okay. I'm looking at you and you look lean. So I'd be like that. I get it. There are athletes out there though, that maybe a 30, 40% body fat and, could benefit from losing X amount of body fat or fat mass in order to A, improve their health and B, improve their performance. That's a different scenario to what I think I'm hearing from you. So that's sort of where I would go with you. And I'd just focus on really training and feeling great. You got a baby mate as well. And like, you don't want to be in a caloric deficit and being grumpy with a newborn. So just just on that, sorry, it's Brad here because I'm probably that um, that other example that you were just um, talking about. Yep. So I'm I'm sitting at 85, 86 kilos. I ideally would love to be 80 kilos. Yep. Um, I'm reasonably new to the sport, um, but 
um, have had sort of more that weight training background. So for me, this is all sort of relatively new. And for me, I have to sort of really sort of try to change my body shape. I've got that yeah. traditional little stocky uh, rugby league sort of um, body, if you want to call it that. Yeah. So ha- how do I manage that? Because I've gone yeah. from four or five weight sessions a week to being, you know, quite solid now to changing my whole training um, regime, my diet yeah. to a degree. And I'm trying to manage that shit. I'm, I don't want to overeat because I'm trying to, I, I need to lose weight, but I also need to have enough fuel to get yeah. me through the sessions. Uh, well, the simple answer is you go and fuel in and that sorts you out. <laughs> but, uh, um, the, no, look, mate. I mean, look, my background was rugby. I'm not built for triathlon either. Um, and, and it's also that thing, like, look, you will stop doing a lot of upper body weights. You just, you might do push ups and chin ups, like, and you're probably going to focus on squats and deadlifts and things like that. And even that your volume of weight training will drop as a result of your aerobic training. Yeah. Um, and that will naturally probably result in you dropping some bulk. Okay. Um, you purposely going out and reducing upper body bulk to be a better triathlete. Like, again, that's what I was talking about. Think like, how old are you? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, 51. 51, mate. Like if you've got lots of lean muscle mass and you're 51 years of age, I would encourage you to keep it. Um, now, I know that probably goes again and just enjoy it. Look, you will lose some muscle mass as you go through the training. That's just a given because you're going to do less hypertrophy type training, uh, intermittent type training. You're doing far more aerobic based training. So it's probably going to happen. I would encourage you again to get a DEXA scan done to at least establish a baseline of where you're at now and then see what happens over time, especially if you drop five kilos, do you drop body fat or plus or minus how much lean muscle mass are you dropping? Sure. That's probably where I'd go. So Mm -hmm. you don't, you look, as I said, you may not lose too much off your legs, but you just, you just naturally will lose it off your upper body. If you've been training like that for a period of time, it's just the way it goes. Sure. And you'll look good in a tri suit anyway. Yeah. The arms won't be hanging off you. So you'll be fine. (laughs) It's just the midriff doesn't look real flash, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing. If you've got, and this is the point of a DEXA. So if you carry midriff body fat, then yeah, you can shift. The first place to lose body fat is off your face and off your midsection. It's not through doing sit ups or any of that crap. It's just that's when you're in a caloric deficit, your energy balance is in a negative state, you will lose body fat. Okay. Mm how big that deficit is will then determine how quickly you lose body fat and plus or minus lean lean mass. So you want to be in a deficit. You don't want it to be so big that you obviously start to lose muscle mass. Sure. That's the balance that you're up against. Yeah. Keeping protein high as a 51 year old male, certainly high. You know, whatever you weigh in pounds, uh, what can I ask what you weigh just quickly? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 80, 85. 85, you said. So you, you're not too far off where I am. So, yeah, good starting. Oh, uh, I think it's like 2.2 times 85. 100, roughly 180 to 190 grams of protein a day. Now, that's a lot of protein. What you will find if you start hitting that amount, similar to the menopausal women, and I'm not saying that like you have similar similarities, but if you start eating more protein, your intake of Refined carbohydrates and fatty foods will probably reduce anyway because you'll feel so full. So that's a good point. And focus on whole foods, real foods, as opposed to what, uh, uh, is it Chris that said the uh, bit about protein bars? You know, like don't eat a lot of protein bars and stuff like that. Like, you know, eat good quality protein foods and you'll, you'll do well. Cool. Todd, did you have any questions? Thanks, Scott. No, I'm I'm all good. Thanks. I'm just uh, yeah. absorbing what you're saying and um, uh, enjoying the questions from others. And um, this is all a bit new to me, so I'm on a learning curve. I'm happy to listen. Thanks. Do you do you eat a lot of protein? Can I ask? Um, well, look, I, I actually <laughs> struggle with the basics to know um, what is protein and what isn't, and 
Fortunately, okay. I've got a wife who's right across all that, so she's educating me. Um, Good. And I'm really interested in what you say about um, how much protein um, should be uh, taken on board per day, but I'm actually trying to work out some basic things, like how do I know how much protein I'm eating? Um, well, and that's... I've got an appetite, um, yep. and um, I don't go hungry, um, but... I mean, what's a quick, easy way to work out how much protein you're consuming? Each yep, month? so a ballpark measure, 100 grams of chicken, fish, beef will contain around 20 grams of protein. Okay, all right. Well, it's, it's a hand, so get a piece of chicken or a steak or a fish or a big bit of tofu as well. Um, so 100 grams of tofu, roughly 20 grams. Get your hand, get a piece of chicken, breast, about the size of your hand, should be about the thickness of a deck of cards and weigh it. It should weigh roughly 200 grams net weight. That theoretically would contain around 40 grams of protein. Okay. So if you start thinking like that, and obviously everyone's hands are different. Um, you know, a female hand might be smaller and therefore she might need a slightly bigger piece of meat or plant protein than her hand in order to hit that 200 grams. But if she weighs it and works it out on the scale, that's a really good way of doing it. Then you could say, can I ask how much you weigh? Uh, 78. Okay. Uh, 79. I kind of move between the two. So let's uh, say you're you're like roughly 170 that. grams of protein. And okay. like others, I have a keen eye on not going over 80. <laughs> <laughs> so you you would say, okay, you need roughly four, four to four and a half hands of protein a day. Yeah. And that's how you're starting to think. Now, obviously, other you said you know, what are proteins? Proteins, it's a good question. Protein is chicken, beef, um, fish, shellfish uh, as primary sources, tofu, seitan, tempo as primary source of protein. But things like legumes, pulses, beans, they contain protein. Piece of bread, slice of bread contains anywhere from six to eight grams of protein. An egg will have about seven grams of protein. Um, yogurt. 200 grams of Greek yogurt, good quality Chobani, will have about 20, 25 grams of protein. In. The way you start to learn what protein has is by tracking. And that's where I would recommend you do some tracking um, using something like MyFitnessPal or Fuelin, whatever, um, to actually upskill yourself in your nutritional knowledge. Yeah, And that's how you start to learn. Because then you... You know, you're not going to track forever, but you just start to learn, oh, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, that sirloin steak had 40 grams of protein in it. Oh, that's good. I hit my target for my meal for the day. I've just got three more hands to hit now. Yeah. And so you just look, go along that process. Yeah, and th look, thank you for that. Uh, to be honest, no. it's, it's not something I've ever thought of before, and I would have no idea how many grams of protein I take on board each day, but I'm now going to start thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah, well, you look like you're in pretty good shape. So uh, you're keeping well, whatever you're doing. Uh, <laughs> I try hard. Uh, um, Matt looks like he's cooking up a storm. Uh, I do. Have what's, a on the, what's, on the, what's on the dinner plate tonight, Matt? Uh, chicken burgers. Chicken burgers, chicken very good. Min mince chicken or a whole chicken breast? Yeah. Uh, chicken breast I've just ground up. So Perfect. free range yep. with leek. They're very good, and you add in some nice um, um, grain some mustard, and grain nice. mustard, and sourdough, and brucons. But anyway, um, great presentation, um, Scott. Really enjoyed that. Two quick questions: Is there a maximum intake per meal of protein that the body will absorb? Well, that was I don't know if you're on it. Like, so this recent study, they were taking in 100 grams of protein, and actually, they still had positive benefits 12 hours later. So that that was the point. Like you can probably take up to 100 grams of protein and still benefit from it. Whereas the previous thought right. used to be like 20 grams of protein, 30, 40 grams of protein. This has sort of blown that out of the water. But the point being is that's a lot of protein taking one hit. However, yeah. what it does mean, if you were short in your protein across the day, say like Todd, you know, he's like, oh God, I didn't eat any at breakfast. I had cornflakes at breakfast. I had a small sandwich at lunch. Mm. God, I've only eaten 20 grams of protein. I need to eat a hundred more. Okay. You can eat it all at dinner. You can have a half kilo T-bone steak and not feel too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Um, 
Uh, and the second question was, I hear your sentiments about protein bars and processed kind of snacks, um, which makes me think I want to go back to try making my own like protein bars with just your know, nuts and and dates in them and add protein powder. Yeah. Um, I mean, is, what else would you recommend for on the bike when you're doing a longer ride? I mean, you can't. Oh, uh, well, I'm not. I'm not. I, I honestly wouldn't recommend a whole lot of protein on the bike, to be honest. All right. Um, so your zone two sessions, you still need carbs. I mean, what's your, what are you pushing? Uh, what each on the zone two? Uh, you lost me there. Uh, how many watts do you sort of produce on average when you're doing a zone two ride, like a low intensity ride? Do you use a power meter or anything like that? No, I don't use the power meter. Okay. What's your I just use a speedo. That's all right. So how fast are you going in zone low intensity? Oh, probably only about 26, you know, and then... That's pretty quick. You're probably, and you're a decent-sized guy, you're probably still exerting somewhere like seven, 800 calories an hour. So, like, the fallacy is, like, you know, cycling, it'd be like, oh, it's just a low-intensity ride. You don't need any carbs. You don't need to eat anything. It, no, you do, because you are actually using a fair bit of energy because you're producing right. a lot of heat. So, you know, those you don't need to necessarily suck down a heap of gels and blocks and liquid carbs, but you can use some of those to augment like what you're taking in. So you could have like, you know, 30, 40 grams of carbs in a bottle and you could eat something like trail mix. So trail mix is nuts, yep. some dried fruit. Perfect. Banana. Banana. Great. Um, yep. You know, things like that. You can make homemade rice cakes. A lot of our, if you go on Holly Lawrence's um, Instagram account, if you want to stalk someone, she she shows a really great video of her making her um, rice cakes. So she gets boiled rice. You can use brown rice, white rice, and you can put either sweet or savory fillings in them. So you, can, right. put, you can put pork mince in there or chicken mince in there if you fancy something like lean um, and savory, a bit of barbecue sauce or sweet chili. It makes it quite sweet. But you know, you wrap that in foil and they're they're pretty solid. They're like, you know, that sort of size. And you just put them in your in your back pocket all wrapped up in foil. And when you stop and have your, if you don't want to eat it as you're on the go, if you're just stopping, you just yeah. eat one of those and then keep going when you have your coffee. Yeah, yeah. So depends on how long you're riding. Look, if you're riding for less than um I'm just gonna move back in. If you're riding for less than sort of 70, 80 minutes, you probably don't need to take on too much food. But if you're going out there beyond sort of 70, 80 and you're going out for a decent ride, just remember you, you know, if you absolutely flog yourself in one of the sessions and then you come in, you always overeat when you come back in. You then get back home, you eat two pizzas and knock off whatever and you might Three as well minutes. knock on for a ride because you've actually just undone every bit of caloric <laughs> expenditure that you've done. So, you know, if you actually keep it under control, and then control what you're doing outside of that, that's how you'll probably have the best impact on things like body composition. Right. Yeah. So don't, and you know, the way we structure it at Fuel In is that you will control what you're doing day to day, but you're fueling when you need to fuel, you fuel those sessions to the absolute. Yeah. You know, if that's a high intensity ride, and you know, and you can take on, you know, 70, 90, 100, 120 grams of carbs an hour, you absolutely take it on because that's going to improve the session outcome. And that's ultimately what you're doing. Cause if you've got good sessions, you're going to adapt to that. And that's what creates progression in terms of athletic performance. Starving yourself in session is just a, it's a, just a very old school way of thinking about training. Yeah. Really it's good. Thank you, you. You, you actually get to eat and it's far more enjoyable doing training when you're eating something. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. No, very good. Righto. Um, well, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll probably lop it off. It's an hour. So, uh, but thank you for joining everyone. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed your questions and hopefully it uh, gave you some uh, fuel for thought, excuse the pun. And uh, you're thinking a little bit about more about protein, which is super important for endurance athletes. Okay. Like I, the, the research is coming out more and more. It, it is limited, but it's certainly more and more and the importance of protein for your overall health and performance is is certainly um, well documented. But thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, if you've got uh, racing or any good sessions, enjoy them and uh, enjoy your protein. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate you talk. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Todd.
Yeah, thanks, thanks Scott. Chris. Terrific. Thanks, thanks very much. Mark. Perfect. Thanks, 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 guys. There'll be a recording of yeah. this, and I'll pop it. Uh, I'll give it to Simon, and he'll probably distribute amongst uh, yeah. amongst the group on Facebook or on email or something. Yeah. Cool. Thank you yes. very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Scott.